There are many, many ways, many things that we can reflect on when we think about who we are. And everything involved in who we are is a reflection in some ways of, of the God who made us. And one of the things about the way that God has created us is He has created us as needy beings. As Americans, we, we like more to focus upon what we can do. And that, that's good in some ways. We, we like our Independence Day and because we took a stand in, in all that we did. So that there's some truth to that. But God has also created us as beings who are needy in many ways. Several weeks ago, uh, we looked at, at a few different lessons that God created us in such a way that we can't learn everything that we need to learn independently. And we can't choose the right ways independently. And we can't even really understand what love is independently. And our culture, whether American culture or whatever hemisphere of the earth we're on, is not going to really help us to understand love if we try to understand that independent and especially independently of God, God has created us to be needy people. This morning I want to think about the battle of sin, that when we face sin, uh, this is something that we are equally in need of God's help as we are in these other areas or in any other way that you can think about. Physically, we are needy creatures, and there's also this thing called sin. And so this morning, I want us to think about how that is a reflection of the way that God created us to be needy creatures. First of all, just think about recognizing sin, and then we'll talk more about the problem of sin in a moment. But without God, if I tried to, tried to avoid the idea of God, then what will I know about sin, even its reality, even its existence? You, you cannot know that without God's help. Because when someone else or we are guilty of sin, there's not a big black spot that grows on our forehead that's an indication of that. And the, uh, the longer we do it, the bigger it gets. That's not the way that God made it. What could you know about sin without God's help? There's some people who view sin in many things like this. In the sky, there is no distinction of east or west and west. People create distinctions out of their own minds and then believe them to be true. And that's, that would have to be our conclusion about sin in the absence of and independent of God's help. And that's exactly what many people would, would prefer. So there are some things that we might just, some distinction we might make up out of our own mind. And it, it can even change. Well, left or right? Are you on the left or the right? Well, it depends on which way I'm facing. That, that answer might change. There are some things that change depending on perspective. But there's other things that don't change depending upon where you are. Think about Adam and Eve. How did they know that sin was a reality? Or was sin just something, this distinction they made in their own minds? Well, even before there was, uh, before God made woman, to Adam, God said, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Here, God uses this word evil on the sixth day that this earth and this whole universe existed. What message was He sending to Adam? There, there is really this thing called evil. And I don't know all that Adam knew about it, but it's, it's obvious that on the day God created Adam and Eve, they immediately had the gift of knowledge, of knowledge that there were some things that they, they just miraculously instantly knew that in the course of time you and I have to learn about. But notice, this was not a distinction that man created in his own mind. Sin is a distinction that God introduced into this world. And then later, maybe you remember the, the friction between Cain and Abel. And so God gives Cain this warning. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. This is the first time that, that I could find in the Bible that the word sin appears. Now, we know there is sin in Genesis chapter 3 with Eve and Satan and Adam, but this is the first time that the word sin is used. Do you think when God used that word to Cain here, that Cain scratched his head and said, Oh, I've never heard about sin. What do you mean sin's at my door? Now, there, these were some ideas that God had already introduced. Again, whether miraculously uh, 
Uh, God gave those to Adam and Eve. I, I don't know for sure, so I won't try to fill in that blank. But Cain had learned over time. There were sacrifices. That's a reflection in part of the knowledge of sin. And of course, there, there are many other words that, that God used to identify this thing to, re, to show that it really exists. Wickedness or iniquity or transgression. You could think of, of others. But the point is, because we can't see sin, it's not something of that sort, then it's something that, that we have to learn from God. And if we don't learn it from God, we can't even know that it exists. But then knowing that something exists and knowing what it is is, a is something that's a little bit different. And so we're equally dependent upon God to know the meaning of sin. And that's important. Adam and Eve, how did they know the meaning of sin? Again, when God talked about that tree of good and evil, well, how did Adam know what good was? And how did he know what evil was? Again, maybe God miraculously gave him that knowledge. Uh, we also... It's, it's stated in Genesis 3 that God came into the garden and spent some time with Adam and Eve. And I, I don't suppose that between Genesis 2 and 3 uh, that the events at the tree just took day the, the eighth day after creation. There had, had been some time to pass. And so maybe God had spent some time with Adam and Eve explaining in more detail these things. Uh, they, they, they knew what it meant not to eat. And in Genesis chapter 3, we even learn they knew some things about what it meant to be naked. They tried to cover themselves and they even hid after they partially covered themselves. They, they knew what these things meant, but it wasn't some distinction they had created in their own mind. God, in a variety of ways, had helped them to understand the meaning of these words, even without a, a, a dictionary for them to go up and look up. Well, what, gee, God said this. What, what did that mean? God had provided a way so that they could know. And the same is true with you and me. We are not miraculously given this knowledge like Adam and Eve, but we learn these things and we are created with a need that we have to go to God in order to know what, what this means, to make any sense of this. So we could look up in a dictionary uh, the word sin. That's one way. But we, we don't have to. Uh, sometimes we learn about words because we know the meaning of one word, and sometimes that helps us learn the meaning of another word. We, we see the opposite, for example. So again, back in Genesis 2 and verse 17, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they're, they're opposites. And so the more that you know about one, then that gives you some basis to begin to and to grow in your understanding of the other. That, that's how we all learn. And then sometimes we learn because there are two words side by side and they mean the same thing. And so if we know one, then that helps us to better understand the other. And so you could find some passages that talk about wickedness and iniquity. So that would not be like good and evil, not opposites, but passages that, that use the same word, verses that use the same word, that helps us to grow in our understanding. Sometimes we understand a word by its context or the other words around it. And so God talks about not eating, and then if you do eat, you're going to die. Does that help Adam to understand what is good or evil a little bit more? Uh, in some senses, a little bit both uh, of both. But death, uh, I believe Adam would have been able to connect evil with death on that occasion. That was, was some of his schooling and his education. So we all learn words in, in these ways. And then sometimes there is in the Bible something like a basic dictionary definition. Well, what does this word mean? And it'll be stated just like this. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Didn't need Mr. Webster or, or others for that. God just gave us this definition that sin is the lack of law. Lawlessness. That, that's, I suppose, the, the best definition of it. An action that goes beyond the law, which implies, well, there must be a lawgiver. Do you know who the lawgiver is? Well, then you know who the definer of these words are. So if, if you like to use a dictionary, then, then find a dictionary. But it, it is essential that we understand what these words mean because understanding what it does mean then helps us to understand what it doesn't mean. And that, that's essential. Uh, 
Uh, if not, then we'll be just as easily deceived as Eve was at the tree when Satan said, well, you will, you will not surely die. So something completely different than the original message. And if not for Satan, we wouldn't have to worry about those things. We could just say, oh, well, this is what God has said, and so that's what is right, and we can just leave it at that. But we can't, because every time God has a plan, even, some, even when God gives a word, Satan is going to find a way to undermine that, distort it, sometimes just slightly alter it, and then sometimes he'll, he'll be uh, uh, even more obvious and just flatly contradict it. And so understanding what sin is is important because we live in a world where people have a whole host and a range of ideas about sin. There are billions of people today who believe that sin is inherited. So, could you answer that question? Is sin inherited? Well, part of it would be, go back to, what is the meaning of sin? Sin is lawlessness. Is, is anybody born a criminal? Now, both of their parents could be on the FBI most wanted list. But if they have a child, now, there's, there's no poster wanted in the, the little newborn picture there. No, that child is totally innocent, regardless of what the parents did. And so that, that gives us some hint and some clue. And sometimes we have to dig deep and study in order to answer some counter-argument that Satan presents. In this case, we don't really have to. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel, Ezekiel 18, verse 20, uh, you read his words and you answer the question, is sin inherited? Ezekiel said, the soul who sins shall die and the son shall not bear the guilt of the Father. And you can read the rest of the verse. It helps, but I think to answer this question, we could stop right there. Lawlessness is not inherited. Sin is not inherited. In fact, if we go back to the garden and apply what Ezekiel said here, what about Cain and Abel? Did the sons bear the guilt of Adam? Well, no, they didn't. Sin is, is not inherited. And so this is a, a human tradition, this is a human doctrine or a human teaching, but it, it contradicts what you can read in the Bible. You're not dependent upon me to be able to answer that question. Well, there are also, I suppose, billions of people who have and do uh, believe that we are born with a sinful nature. And so the distinction would be, well, we're not born as sinners, we don't inherit sin, but we're born with a nature that is, that is drawn to sin, drawn to rebellion against God, and in fact from birth already in rebellion against God. And I'll just give, give this illustration so you, you can just see. I'm not just making this up out of thin air. Uh, this was a tract that I found here in Fairbanks by a religious group in the area. And they said, when Adam and Eve were created, Satan tempted them and they sinned. And of course, the, the stink and the stain is just an illustration. When Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't, didn't look or appear any different. But then notice they say, and, and that's true, they sinned. But notice, then they give a picture of a little, I don't know, three-year-old, a child in a high chair who's dumped his bowl of cereal on his head, and he's smiling about it. And they say, because of what Adam and Eve did, sin was passed down to us. And then they give a scripture. I'm glad they give a scripture. That gives us something to compare. But even notice the scripture that they use. This is from Romans 5. By one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have what? All have sinned. This doesn't say that they inherited death or inherited sin. It says that they have sinned. Now, let me, let me back up. It does say that death was passed upon all, but the sin is attributed to who? To all men, not to an inheritance. And so this, 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 goes, this opens up uh, a big, messier, longer discussion of well, what, what is sin? If, if sin is in my nature, if sin is a, a part of the nature of humans, well, was Adam human? He was human. God did God create him with a, a human nature? And some will say, well, no, no, it happened later because he chose to sin. Well, but why did he sin if he didn't have a sinful nature? 
And then that raises the problem, what about Jesus? Because was Jesus a human? Did he have human nature? He was manifested in the flesh. So now that creates a whole other sort of problem, and man has to create all kinds of counter-doctrines to, sort, to support their doctrine, their teaching. I'm not trying to support my, my own teaching. I'm trying to, to understand and to see, well, what did God say that sin is? And if I understand the meaning, that, that would, would have protected Eve in some ways from Satan, and that will protect us as well when the very definition of sin becomes altered and given a different shade. And so we are needy, and without God's help, well, how, how would we know? But God created us needy, and if we'll go to Him for help, then He'll provide for us. He will show us the meaning of words such as these. We also could not grasp the consequences of sin without God's help. In a temporary way, we, we would sometimes, like the book of Proverbs shows on a variety of, uh, in a variety of areas, well, if I do this... It's not going to, in, in physical terms, not going to go well. And there are some things that very quickly and immediately show, uh, as far as physical things, not, not a good decision. But the, the outcome, as, as we're studying in the book of Job, the outcome of some decision does not always prove uh, the, the innocence or the guilt of the one who is suffering. And in the Lord's Supper, <laughs> we are reminded of that. Jesus died... And by the, the thinking of Job's friends, well, that proves that he did something wrong. Well, the outcome is not always the way to prove the innocence or guilt of someone. And we're, we're here together on the first day of the week because Jesus arose from the dead. That, that was an evidence of, uh, of his innocence. So the consequences of sin are something that we, we would struggle, beyond struggle, would, would be impossible to know without the help of God. But then God has provided what we've needed. Jesus taught, for example, that sin is like an unpayable debt. Can you think back to the time when you were deep, the deepest in debt that you've ever been? That's not a comfortable feeling. And so Jesus said, well, sin is like that. Or can you think to the time that you were the sickest that you've ever been? And Jesus teaches sin is like that. Or if you think about death, Romans 6, verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. Everything that you associate with death, the way that we look at death, is the way that God looks at sin. And death, in some ways, makes it a little bit easier to grasp and get a handle on everything that is, is painful and, and terrible about death. Well, the same is true in regard to sin. So, God helps us in these ways to understand the consequences of sin. But then in, in some ways, in, in more spiritual terms, in, in John chapter 3, verse 16, the consequences of sin uh, are given there that, that God gave His Son, His only begotten Son. Why, why did He have to give something? Because I have given something. Because you have given something. Because you've done something called sin. And the consequence of that, if there was going to be forgiveness is that there had to be suffering, there had to be death, and Jesus was the only one that could provide that. How else would we measure sin if we didn't have Jesus' death? Well, we'd probably do what we've all been tempted to do and maybe done at some time or the other. Well, my sin, value-wise, seems quite small because, I mean, when I watch the headline news, I see some awful people out in the world. And when I read a little bit about the history of mankind, the last 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, there's some awful people back there. And boy, I, I compared to them, am, am not so bad, so we might think. And by comparison, we, we would think that way. We easily think that way. But when we go to what the Bible teaches about the consequences of sin, that sin or the, res, uh, the consequences of sin are that Jesus was crucified and all the way that that picture was painted as we read in the 22nd Psalm, that, that helps us to understand the consequences of our, of our sin. Turn to Matthew chapter 25. Jesus also offered this warning. And in part, what He said here helps us to, to place a value on, to understand the wages 
and the consequences of sin. And it, it's quite simple and short here. Matthew 25, you can read some of the background of what led Jesus to saying this. But in verse 46, Jesus said that these will go away into everlasting punishment. That, that helps us to set, to, to place a value upon and to better understand the consequences of sin, everlasting punishment. We, we don't know of any everlasting punishment because in physical terms, the worst you can get, it seems, just depending on how you view it, is either life in prison or the death penalty. But both of those have a limit, don't they? But Jesus says there is punishment that comes to these, and it is everlasting punishment. And so God provides all of these ways. If, if we will rely upon Him, then He helps us to understand the meaning and the consequences and the very reality of sin. And Satan is doing everything that he can to blur, uh, to blur that view and that knowledge. If Satan can convince us there is no God, well then, guess what he's done? Well, then there is no sin. There is nothing that is absolutely, always, in every place, right or wrong. And so Satan can work that way, but he doesn't have to make you totally disbelieve in the existence of God to obscure sin uh, if he can just alter the definition of it. And he's accomplishing the same thing. Uh, but in reality, if we'll consider God then all of Satan's efforts actually help us to better understand that God created us needy. Satan's lies help us to recognize, well, how, how will I know what is true or not true? And that is a reminder that God created us dependent upon Him needing His help. Well, if I need God's help to understand the problem, then did God just leave it up to me to figure out the solution to the problem? No, I am equally dependent upon God's help for that as well. How, how can I find and identify the solution to this problem? Well, we remember Jesus' death just a few minutes ago. Uh, Jesus gave that memorial uh, of His body, of His blood, of His death. But there's another part of that that is equally important. If, if Jesus died, He would have been no different than any other prophet or teacher in visible terms, but... One of the things that set Jesus apart, of course, was the fact that after He died, on the first day of the week, when the women came to the tomb, they were met there by angels who said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. What was Jesus doing here? Not, not, just, not just showing that He was right and they were wrong. Jesus was showing, Look, I have conquered death. And what is it that's connected with death? The wages of sin is death. And so if death is conquered, then sin is conquered. And Jesus here showed Himself to be the one who conquered both. Another way that God shows us the solution is by also stating the other side of Matthew 25 and verse 46. Jesus also offers eternal life. There are some who will go to everlasting punishment. There will some are some who will go into eternal life or everlasting life. Well, why why can they go? What what's the distinction there? Well, Jesus provides the distinction. He compared sin to an unpayable debt. Well, Jesus is called the Redeemer, the one who would buy back those who who cannot dig themselves out of the hole that they put themselves in. Sin is like a disease. Well, how does Jesus describe Himself as the solution? He's, he's the great physician. And sin is connected with death. And Jesus shows that He provides the perfect solution to that. And it would include all of His life in many ways, but His death and His resurrection especially highlight the solution to the problem that man has, each of us, have created for ourselves. Now, there is a solution but then when does God give that solution? That, that's equally important to know. It's good to know if there's some medicine for my illness. It's good to know if there's some money to pay my debt. Uh, but but when, when is that check released to me? When can I fill that prescription? When is the solution to my problem given? And that, that could be a whole other study, but let me just summarize it this way, that after 
a few days after Jesus was raised from the dead, He was preparing His apostles to go and, and tell the world, to tell every creature that this solution was now available. And on one occasion, He prepared them to do that work by saying, All authority has been given to Me in heaven and on earth. That, that's the foundation. Jesus is the Christ. He has all authority over, sin, over, over death and even the authority to forgive sins. And so He tells them, with that foundation, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now this doesn't tell us everything, but this tells us a little bit of something about the solution, God's solution to our problem. Now a few days later, again after His resurrection, but before He returned to heaven, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe will be condemned. The solution to the problem. That's what He was preparing them to do. And they did that. They took that message. And then on one other occasion, He told them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and arise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So does this help? In summary form, there are some other verses and concepts we could look at. But does this help us to answer the question, when God gives the solution, it, it's already available, but this is when God gives the solution to our sin. It, another way to view these verses and apply them is, well, how do I know that my sins have been forgiven? How do I, how do I know they have been forgiven? Well, I've, I've got to find the one who has the solution and, and ask him. And even though my name and your name is not in the text, uh, each of us are in one of these verses, or, or all of these verses, rather. Is we have been forgiven or we've not been forgiven. How do we know? Well, here, Jesus will help us to know. But again, I, I, I don't think I would do as I ought if I just would leave it at that, I wish I could. That, that would be much easier. But at the tree, in the garden, God gave a plan. And then Satan obscured that and altered it and, and contradicted it. And the same is true today, that Satan is going to take the words of Christ and he, if he can convince us not to listen to Christ at all, then that's part of his mission. But if he can take the words of Christ and alter them, then he's going to accomplish the same thing. Just take the simplicity, because of the simplicity of the statement, Mark's record. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And just like there are billions of people who say, well, sin is inherited. And so that newborn child is guilty of sin, has inherited the sin of Adam. Well, that's why, maybe you know the practice called infant baptism. Why, why do they do that? Well, they do that because of the idea, well, that, that baby has sin, and that sin has to be taken away. And so what they do is they, they say they baptize the baby, and then they say that forgives the sin, washes the sins of the baby away, and then later that, that baby might grow up and believe. But if you analyze that, that's teaching he that is baptized is saved. And then a few years later, grow up and gain the mental ability to believe and might do so. So how does that fit with what Jesus said? He who believes and is baptized will be saved, or he who is baptized will be saved and will later believe. Can you just see that those are not the same solutions? And then over the course, because of the course of time, uh, and one, two wrongs don't make a right. And so in response to one error, men often overreact to a different kind of error. And so it's so common and prevalent today, the idea that he who believes is saved. And baptism comes later. So analyze that and just compare, not my teaching with your teaching or our teaching with another's teaching. What, what is Jesus' teaching? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Is that the same or different as he who believes is saved and will later be baptized? You, you answer the question. 
you know, my, my goal here is to help us to see, uh, to recognize the problem of sin, and we're dependent upon God to do that. And as sure as we know there is a God, then we also know there is, is a Satan. And when we learn the truth of God, then that helps us to identify His plans and His teachings. And so we, we have to be aware to the truth. That's our help. But we have to be aware of the danger that, that Satan plans against us. And so Satan does all that he can to interfere in every area. Uh, anytime God reveals something, then Satan will have something different. And so we're dependent upon God's help for the solution to the problem. But then God didn't just... Jesus didn't come to this earth just so to forgive our past sins so then we can uh, just go merrily on our way and, and it make no change in our lives. The, the challenge of... We will continue to face the challenge of sin. And we are continually as dependent upon God for His help then just as we were before. And turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. And by the way, in the first 11 verses, Paul has done in some ways what, what I've been doing. He says, look, here, here's what happened. God was leading His people, and then Satan deceived them and, and misled them. And so after he warned and talked about the ways that they were misled, then in verse 12 he says, just in case we might look at the Israelites and say, oh, they were just foolish and, and spiritually stupid. How could they do that? So before we start comparing ourselves to others, then Paul says, well, let him that thinks that he stand take heed lest he fall. And so he, he humbles us to say, well, be careful. You, you might have more in common with them than you realize. Verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, even, even those Israelites, we might say. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. We are dependent upon God's help to resist temptation. And here Paul tells us it, it begins with humility. Resisting temptation begins with humility and the admission that at any time I, I could be wrong. I, I may have fallen and not realized it. And so that, that takes a little bit of the wind out of my sails, but then Paul adds the right kind of wind to our sails, so to speak, when he reminds us Whatever we are tempted by, we're, we're not the first one. We're not unique. We're not the, the weakest to ever live. And, and there's just no hope for us. What we're tempted with, everybody has, others have been tempted with. And then he adds some more wind to the sails, arms us with the confidence that God is faithful. So he, he's talking the context of, of temptation. In temptation, God is faithful. And if we give some just a few moments worth of thought to that. Well, meditating on the faithfulness of God as some of the songs we've sung today and often do remind us, well, the faithfulness of God should, what, what should be my response to God's faithfulness? Well, then I should want to please God. I, I should be willing to search my heart and the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart and seek to be pleasing to Him, to be faithful to Him. He's faithful to me. And then in temptation, His faithfulness means He will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but He says He will make a way of escape. doesn't mean we will always choose to follow the way of escape, but if we don't follow the way that's available, that's our unfaithfulness, not God's unfaithfulness. God is faithful. We, we need that degree of confidence, not in ourselves independent of God, but our confidence in Him for every temptation, there is a way of escape so that you can bear it. And that, I think that's an important point, that any time there is a temptation, there is some kind of a burden if we don't give in to it. Of course it's easier to do it. But he says there will be a burden that comes with resisting temptation, but God has a way for you uh, to be able to carry that. And when we do resist temptation, not just the outward act, but also the inward appeal that is offered to that, just as it was with Eve, it wasn't just holding the fruit and eating the fruit, it, there was an inward appeal. 
And every temptation has that in some way. But what he says is, you'll be able to bear it. If, if you'll make your decisions, not my will, but your will be done, then we're depending upon him for how to, to deal with that struggle. And if that is our mindset, then that produces growth, that produces fruit, that produces strength. Resisting temptation is a part of God's plan to remember our total dependency upon Him. And that's a part of His plan to help us to grow. And so God is faithful, but the reality is we, we have sinned. And even after our sins have been forgiven, we can then look into the, own, the book of our own history and see, I, I have sinned again. And that creates a burden, and yet God is still faithful. God is faithful. He makes a way of escape when we didn't resist the temptation. In Acts chapter 8, there was a relatively young Christian named Simon. And the temptations were, in, in some ways, no different after he was a Christian than they were before. Now, he had access to greater help, but the external temptations and some of the inward temptations in some ways didn't change. And he repeated some of his old sins but Peter told him, well, here's the way of escape for God's people. Repent and pray perhaps a thought of your heart may be forgiven you. God, God was faithful, and Peter was assuring Simon of that, that if you'll return to Him, then He's waiting, He's available. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We are totally dependent, even as a Christian, when, when we sin. And then last, and just briefly, in James chapter 5 and verse 16, James reminds us, confess your faults one to another. That's another area that reminds us of, uh, not, uh, of that we are not independent, that first we need God's help in ways that no one can. But then there are times where we, others who may or may not be aware of our sin, need to know of our sin. We need their help. We need their strength. We need their encouragement. And if we've learned the humility of 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, then it doesn't mean we, it always has to be a public confession. There are times where that, that's proper, but we need people whom we can trust and confide in, even acknowledge our guilt to, and seek help and encouragement from. And that's why there is this thing called the church. Those whom God has saved, those whom are forgiven, then this provides those whom we could even, uh, even trust enough to confess our faults too. And so it, it feels good to be independent, at least for a season, but it's, it's impossible to be independent from God. We, we have our breath. We borrow our breath and our life from Him. It's, it's impossible to be completely independent of Him, but it's, it's an eternal tragedy. It is self-destructive even to try. Uh, you, you don't have to want God's help, but you need God's help. And that's why Jesus came to this earth. Uh, that's why He was willing to suffer. That's why He was willing to die. Take out your songbooks and turn to number 309. And I'll just put again the verses we read a few minutes ago. This song invites us to reflect upon uh, whether we believe that we stand or whether we have fallen and that we remain fallen in our sin. If you're visiting us this morning and you have questions about anything that I've said, I hope you'll ask. Uh, but if you're here this morning and you don't have any questions, you know the problem that you've created and you know the solution that Jesus offers, then He offers Himself to you. That, that is His invitation. If you know that He is the Christ, the Son of God, and that He is God, then repent of your sins, leave the sins uh, that put Him on that cross, and confess your faith, your own faith, with your own mouth, and be baptized into Christ, and He will keep His promise. He is faithful. If we can help you in that, if we can help you as a Christian in returning to that commitment and returning to that God, you have to do that in your heart. But if we can help and encourage you and stir you up again, uh, we're here to do exactly that. If in these ways or any ways we, we can help you, tell us how. If not, let's sing this song with the reliance upon God that we need His help. And the song will remind us of that. If we can help you in some way, come forward and tell us how as we stand and sing.